Herod and where he planned to be buried. We were trying to locate his burial place uh, in the course of our excavations. Uh, uh, we uh, found a very impressive building. Uh, we thought that might be the mausoleum. The first century historian Flavius Josephus records the funerary procession of the great King Herod. It was magnificent. Slaves and hundreds of pounds of spices accompanied the bodies that came here to the Herodium to be interned. Because of the discovery of a course of stones connecting with these buildings, it is believed that the monumental building behind me may in fact still hold the intact tomb of Herod the Great. Excavations in this area were stopped because of the rise of the Palestinian Intifada in 1987. But when excavators renew their archaeological work, who knows what hidden treasure may still be found within the tomb of King Herod. I'm standing right on the magnificent street that we have exposed in the last two years, dating back to what we call the days of the Second Temple if you like, Herodian times of Jerusalem, more or less the first century of the uh, Common Era, uh, when Jerusalem was its, at its height, uh, which finally came to an end in the year 70 Common Era, when it was destroyed by the Romans. We decided here to excavate near the walls of the Temple Mount, the big wall next to me here is the western wall of the Temple Mount, uh, in Jerusalem, maybe the largest uh, building uh, in the country at all, and one of its, great, of its largest of its kinds in the ancient uh, early Roman world, built by King Herod in the last decades of the first century BC. And we are in the valley, and we have exposed here a sample about 70 meters of a street which was at least 500 meters long, which is the length, the original length of the Temple Mount. And um, so I'm in the street, we can see the curbs of the street on both sides. And uh, we have also exposed remains, traces of shops opening to the street from the west, from the east, bought, sold, uh, all kinds of things which we will still have to uh, figure out when we will examine the finds which we have found. One of the archaeological evidences for Jesus in Jerusalem is found here at the Pool of Bethesda. According to John chapter 5, there was a pool here near the sheep pools surrounded by five porticos. We know from the existence of a Byzantine church that was once in the site that it marked a holy place. And so it is pretty certain that this was that ancient pool. It was originally constructed around the site from Hellenistic times where a Greek healing cult, the cult of Asclepius, was. And when Jesus came in, the healing traditions continued at this pool. There was a lame man, according to the Gospels, who was here seeking to be placed into the waters when they were stirred. According to that tradition, whoever was first placed in would find himself healed immediately. However, Jesus did not put the man into the water. Instead, by the authority of his own word, he commanded the man to take his pallet and rise up and walk. Archaeology also uniquely attests to figures mentioned in the New Testament. In the trial of Jesus, for instance, two figures are prominently mentioned, Caiaphas, the high priest, and Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. In Jerusalem, the ossuary containing the bones of Caiaphas was discovered, and in Caesarea, a stele mentioning Pontius Pilate. In John 19, 13, it says that Pilate then brought Jesus out and took a seat on the judgment bench at a place which is called the Lithostrathos, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. The Greek term Lithostrathos refers to the stone pavement upon which the judgment seat was placed. Here in the Church of Condemnation and in a section of floor stretching into the Sisters of Zion convent, are the remains of that floor, striated so that the horse's hooves coming into that place of judgment would not slip, and carved with some of the games that it's thought the Roman soldiers played. The first evidence of a crucified victim from the first century was discovered at Givat HaMiftar, a suburb of Jerusalem. 
The Roman spike piercing the heel bone had apparently bent when nailing to the cross and had to be buried with the victim. Its discovery now shows how the body was positioned during crucifixion, a position confirmed by archaeological graffiti of crucified victims from the first centuries. Some 20 years ago, I've excavated in the Holy Sepulchre in what is called now the Chapel of St. Bartholomew, the Armenian chapel. One can say that there is high probability that this is the place of the Holy Sepulchre because the place is riddled by tombs, tombs from the time of the Second Temple, tombs that are contemporaneous with Jesus. So there is high probability that this is the right place where the burial took place. Within the Holy Sepulchre Church today is still preserved a portion of the escarpment of Mount Calvary called Golgotha, the place of the skull. Behind me is a portion of that rock still protruding, and beyond that is a portion preserved which reveals part of the crack made by the earthquake, which according to the Gospels occurred when Jesus was crucified. But the tomb in which Jesus was laid was not a niche type or colchim tomb, but an archosolium, which had an arch and then room at the head and at the feet. Rolling stones like those that sealed the tomb of Jesus may still be found in parts of Jerusalem today. Stones like this would have weighed several tons, and across it would have been stretched several bands containing a seal, the seal of Roman authority, which no power on earth would tamper with unless they sought to challenge Rome itself. Archaeology has its own inherent limitations. For instance, archaeology can present to us the raw data, but the interpretation of these facts still remain for biblical scholars. An example of this is here at Bethsaida, at this kitchen area, where we find a, a grinding area and a grinding stone where meals were prepared in ancient times. We know this was the city of some of the disciples. It was uh, told to me by the excavator that a priest who came to this area asked, could this kitchen have been used in the first century? Yes. Could this kitchen have been used by uh, the disciples? Yes. Could Mary have prepared some of the food for the disciples in this kitchen? In which the excavator said, well, it's possible. In which case, the priest then came on his knees with those who were with him on their knees and kissed this very stone. Believing all of a sudden that this, in fact, was the very stone used by Mary to prepare a meal for the disciples of our Lord. Now, Archaeology can't give us those exact types of facts. All it can give us is a kitchen with stones. The interpretation of those facts remain to the scholars. As we have seen, archaeology has revealed many of the significant figures and events mentioned in the Bible. While archaeology can neither prove nor disprove the Bible, it justifies the verdict that the Bible is trustworthy in its historical statements. What remains is for us to individually come to recognize the God who controls this history and has personally entered into it. This is a matter of faith, but thanks to archaeology, it is a holy faith supported by the hard facts. This faith must be in the message of the Bible, which is itself our greatest archaeological document. As archaeological excavations continue, we can be assured that as an ongoing witness to this word, the stones will cry out.